Elon Musk just exposed how a cosmonaut got stuck in space. Friday, December 26th, 1991. On Earth, the Soviet Union, one of only two nations to ever achieve contemporary superpower status and a longtime foe of America during the Cold War, is in danger. The country will no longer exist by the end of the day, and the fantasy of Stalinism will also vanish forever. As their countries are released from Soviet rule, many people in Eastern Europe embrace their newly acquired independence. Even former Soviet residents anticipate a better future. Nonetheless, one man watches the Earth below with apprehension from above. How and why this happened? Let us find out as the tech billionaire Elon Musk will update us all. Hello everyone, welcome back to Elon Musk Evolution, where we bring you the most recent news about Elon Musk and his multi-billion dollar companies, space news, and the latest science and technology. But before we begin, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon so you don't miss any of our amazing videos. He is the lone surviving Soviet citizen trapped inside a Soviet space station that is rapidly disintegrating all around him. Aside from that, he has nowhere to go. Even if the Soviets lost to the United States in the race to the moon, the Soviet space program's great minds had won in many more practical ways. By launching two human military reconnaissance stations and two civilian research stations into orbit as part of the Salyut program, the Soviet Union became the first country to have a permanent presence in space. From these stations, the Soviet Union could spy on the United States and its allies. However, the Soviets realized, as the Salyut program came to an end, that the next step in space necessitated going bigger. Although the Soviets had plans to lay the groundwork for genuine interplanetary travel, the Americans may have been the first to walk on the moon. A permanent human space station would be necessary for such. On February 19, 1986, the initial Mir module was launched, followed by additional modules in 1989 and 1990. There were uncertainties over the viability of building such a big structure in orbit because nobody has attempted it to this point. In their pre-Apollo hardware experiments conducted in 1966, the Americans were the first to demonstrate that docking two spaceships in space was feasible. This had been no easy task because, with both vehicles traveling at a high rate of speed, even the slightest mistake may result in catastrophe. Many believe that docking two vehicles in orbit was simply too challenging for human pilots, but the Americans were able to do it with computer aid. This would be crucial for the Apollo program because the delicate lunar module, which would be attached on top of the command module in the proper position, would prevent the service and command modules from fitting aboard the Saturn rocket. A fairing had to be attached to the top of the launch vehicle in order to safeguard the sensitive lunar module as it was being placed into orbit. In fact, the fairing would enclose the lunar module within and extend up to the service module. When the command and service modules reached orbit, they would separate from the launch vehicle, turn around, and gently dock with the lunar module still fastened to the top of the launch vehicle. After being firmly docked to the command and service modules, the attached lunar module would be dragged out of the fairing using thrusters. The entire procedure on Apollo 14 was quite precise, and everything nearly went wrong. However, docking two extremely large structures intended for human habitation was quite another from the relatively small lunar module. The large masses involved may have disastrous effects if there was any issue with the docking technique, making it exceedingly dangerous. A module may collide with another, potentially tearing them apart and costing tens of millions of dollars in structural damage and years of lost labor. At worst, this would render the module permanently uninhabitable. The worst case scenario is that a new module could collide with already occupied ones, leaving cosmonauts inside vulnerable to space radiation. 
The second module of the Mir space station was successfully docked in 1989. However, as a testament to the Soviet Union's capability, despite the fact that they had recently built the largest man-made structure in space, the Soviets had nonetheless lost the race to the moon. An orbiting laboratory that was the envy of the entire globe was built by adding a third module a year later to the original construction. But even as the Soviet program achieved revolutionary successes, the Soviet Union was facing serious problems. A military crisis in Afghanistan and a domestic political crisis beset the Soviet Union in the middle of the 1980s. The still-in-force ideas of the Stalin era were causing an increasing amount of resentment, and the satellite Soviet republics in Eastern Europe were bubbling with revolutionary fervor. When liberal Mikhail Gorbachev was elected General Secretary in 1985, he quickly set to work ousting senior officials with strong ties to past governments. Gorbachev desired a fresh start and to compete with the West in areas other than merely economics and quality of life. The Soviet Union needed to be liberalized. Gorbachev's reforms, however, were met with resistance from nationalistic movements since so many Soviet residents had spent decades being brainwashed by Soviet propaganda. Soviet republics were preparing to openly rebel, and Gorbachev was under intense pressure. He implemented a number of policies that liberalized the Soviet Union, including reducing state control of the economy and even repealing the strict censorship laws that had governed the Soviet Union almost since its founding in order to placate these satellite republics and internal Soviet citizens. Even if it wasn't ideal, his attempts to establish a more democratic system in which Soviet citizens may secretly vote for various Communist Party candidates was a significant improvement over the decades-long oppression the Soviet people had been subjected to. Nevertheless, this was insufficient. People were taking to the streets in open defiance of Soviet control throughout Eastern Europe to seek freedom. Demonstrating even the police and military were told not to intervene as a protest erupted right in the center of Moscow, much to everyone's astonishment. It was almost the end for the Soviet Union. A peaceful internal revolution in Poland was a success, and it spread to other countries. Gorbachev himself believed that it was no longer possible to maintain the old Soviet Empire, despite the wishes of many hardliners who wanted him to use force to put an end to the revolution. A direct request from the U.S. to Gorbachev to refrain from using force was also made, and he honored that request. Numerous Soviet satellite republics quickly declared their independence and split off. Next would be Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. And as the collapse of the Soviet Union drew closer, the Communist Party became more and more concerned. On August 18, 1991, senior officials detained Gorbachev at his residence because they felt that immediate action was necessary to avert the imminent collapse. Future uncertainty was a concern for cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev. Together with Commander Anatoly Artsebarsky, Krikalev had launched for the 9th Mir mission on May 19, 1991. As their flight engineer, Krikalev consequently consented to remain on board Mir for the following crew. By October, the Soviets were in trouble because they had finally run out of money and had no alternative way to deploy another crew. However, the Mir required an engineer to stay on board at all times. Otherwise, if the entire crew went home, the station would deteriorate and finally fall back to Earth. Krikalev and Arsabarsky were monitoring the situation on Earth. Even though the cosmonauts were technically not permitted by the Soviet space program, ham radio operators all around the world had been in contact with them. Through their ham radio chats, the cosmonauts were able to hear what was happening down home without it being carefully filtered by ground control. The subsequent two flights to Mir were canceled as the political situation deteriorated, leaving only one flight. Krikalev bravely offered to stay on board Mir and said his farewell to the departing crew, knowing that the Soviet Union and its space program faced an uncertain future. He was now the sole human in orbit. 
Fortunately for Krikalev, some help would arrive from the United States. Krikalev was eventually freed after spending nearly a full year in space and at the time holding the record for the longest period spent in orbit at 311 days. Krikalev ensured the Mir would last for another 10 years and give humanity the know-how it would need to build the Mir's bigger brother, the International Space Station, by courageously choosing to put his nation, as well as the hopes of all of humanity's ambitions in space, over his own safety and comfort. At a joint news conference, representatives from Roscosmos and NASA announced that an unmanned Soyuz spacecraft, MS-23, would be launched to the International Space Station on February 20th to return NASA astronaut Frank Rubio and Russian cosmonauts Dmitry Petalin and Sergei Prokopayev to Earth. Joel Montalbano, ISS Program Manager at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, stated, We're not calling it a rescue Soyuz, I'm referring to it as a substitute Soyuz. The crew is currently safe in the space station. In September, MS-22 carried Petalin, Prokopayev, and Rubio to the International Space Station after taking off from Kazakhstan's Baikonur Cosmodrome, which is run by Russia. It has been decided to extend their stay on the ISS by several more months. Originally, they were supposed to return to Earth in the same spacecraft in March. After being struck by what U.S. and Russian space officials believe to have been a tiny space rock, MS-22 started leaking coolant on December 14th, just before Russian cosmonauts were scheduled to start a spacewalk. The current theory is that this damage was brought on by a small particle with a diameter of around one millimeter, according to Sergei Krikalev, Executive Director of Human Spaceflight Programs at Roscosmos. And that ends today's episode. What did you think of this episode? Let us know your thoughts in the comment box below. And please subscribe and don't forget to like today's video. And we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.